Hi, everybody. Welcome back to our audience. Thank you for bearing with us. We are finally streaming live with sound, I believe, this time. I am Diana Limon Mercado, your chair of the Travis County Democratic Party. We're joined tonight by our two candidates running for, to be the next Travis County Party Chair, Katie Naranjo. Katie. Hi. And Ed Espinosa. Ed. Howdy. And I'm joined by two co-moderators and wonderful friends of the Travis County Democratic Party, our former party chair, the Honorable Judge Dan Soifer. Hey. And former party chair, Vincent Harding. Hey, everybody. Tonight, our format will be two minute opening remarks, starting with Ed and then with Katie, and then we'll be alternating through questions for the rest of the evening. Opening remarks will be two minutes, responses for each question will be two and a half minutes, and we'll get through as many questions as we can in the next hour. Um, closing remarks will again be two minutes, and up first for closing will be Katie and followed by Ed. Up first to kick us off is opening remarks, and we're going to start with Ed. Thanks, Diana, Katie, Vincent, and Jan, uh, and all the precinct chairs. Uh, I know that we're, this is an unusual election, but we are in unusual times, and I appreciate everybody coming to hear what we have to say tonight. My name is Ed Espinoza, and I'm running for Travis County Democratic Party Chair because I feel a fierce sense of urgency towards November. I know that this election will be like no other, and there's more than Travis County at stake. We have our whole state and nation at stake as well. I'm running because we need to do three things. We need to run up the score in Travis County. If we can get a higher vote total out of this state, it can help us stay out of this county, it can help us statewide. Number two, we need to diversify fire party. We've done a good job. We need to keep doing it. We have to look like the people we're fighting for, both at the precinct chair level, in terms of our voter turnout, and in terms of our contractors. Number three, we've got to have media and talking points that give people confidence to repeat the things that we believe in, that they believe in, so that we can shape public opinion, move votes, and get good policy enacted. And realize that what we do here in Travis County is in many ways bigger than just Travis County. Not only can we run up the score and impact the state, but we also affect what happens at the state legislature. We also have a media market where our work gets covered and therefore influences opinions in Hayes County and Williamson County and other neighboring counties. We have a sense of urgency in front of us. We need the experience and the vision to do it. I like to think that I bring both and I would appreciate your consideration. You can find out more about me at edespinoza.com. That's Ed Espinoza with a Z. Thanks. Thank you, Ed. Katie, you're up next. First, I wanna thank the precinct chairs, activists, and volunteers who are watching tonight's forum. Um, I know public participation is really important in this decision because it's important who leads our party. And I think both Ed and I can um, let you know that we would not be doing this were not for Diana stepping up to another challenge and uh, that we, we are uh, very happy to be running alongside each other. I grew up volunteering on campaigns with my grandmother in Deep East Texas because she taught me that Democrats lift people up. I got involved when I came to the University of Texas in 2004 as a university Democrat, volunteering on numerous campaigns, including the 20 million times it took to get Donna Howard elected to HD 48. Uh, ultimately serving as College Democrats of America president, which is where I first met Ed at the DNC. I've been a precinct chair, I've been CDW president, and I volunteered time raising money for the Travis County Democrat Coordinated Campaign to make sure that we had the resources needed to, uh, to get coverage for our paid phones and mail program in 2016. And I started my own consulting firm focused on digital organizing because I needed to make a living wage and frankly needed health insurance. So I very much understand what it's like for our canvassers and campaigners when it comes to needing support as a worker. I will do the work and I will have the hard conversations necessary to build trust and community across all communities. I think it's extremely important that we take no voter or community for granted when it comes to organizing this fall. We must unite because there is more that unites us than divides us, and we cannot participate in cancel culture that says one group or organization or person is supposed to be a part of the party more or over the other group. I believe we have to invest in the power of people. I've put out a plan at katieforchair.com. It's detailed, apologize, uh, and long, but it's got my democratic organizing principles as well as the vision I have for the party. I hope to earn your vote. Thank you. 
Thank you for those opening remarks, Katie and Ed. Um, I forgot to mention that tonight's questions were prepared for us by our wonderful advisory committee, which is um, Bob Sheldon, Lynn Kirk, Sandra Ragona, Teresa Pham, Carrie jo Jones, and Roy Woody. Um, thank y'all so much for putting those questions together for us. We're gonna alternate between myself and our former party chairs, Vince Harding and Judge Jan Soifer. Up first is gonna be Vince. Each candidate gets two and a half minutes to response, Response starting with Katie, and then following that, Judge Soifer will be up with a second question and alternating through the rest of the questions this evening. Vince? Well, thank you, Katie and Ed, for stepping up. I will go ahead and get right to it. Uh, first question is, talk to us about your short-term vision and plan for the November 3rd election, as well as what is your long-term vision and plan for the party as you see it for the next five years or so? So the reason I got into this race was because of my experience in over 100 Democratic campaigns and progressive causes, as well as raising over $8 million for Democrats on the ballot. I feel strongly that we have to make sure that we're organizing in every precinct across this county, not just in the donut hall, which is Austin, but the donut itself and make sure that we have uh, strategies in place to lift up the precinct chairs who are some of our most underutilized experts in their neighborhoods and uh, as campaigners, and also making sure that we're investing in our clubs to do the community outreach. We also have to make sure that voters are well aware of how they can safely cast their vote this November when it comes to the constitutional right to vote by mail as well as in person. We have to have multi-layered strategies in terms of communicating to voters, whether it be through mail, phones, text messages, uh, advertising, email, and video. Um, if we have a layered approach to communicating to voters, we can break through the wall that uh, voters put up when it comes to too much noise. I also think that it's really important that uh, we have the money necessary and that we raise that money in order to make sure that we don't have to make decisions about which part of the, the county we are organizing in because every precinct is important and no voter or community should be taken for granted when it comes to asking for their support. Long term, the party has to be engaged in community and coalition building. We can't just come to folks in the community every year at election time asking for their vote. We need to be out there organizing with them, whether it's in their rallies or for legislation they support. There are advocacy groups um, across the county and across the state who are working on social justice issues, climate change, reproductive rights, gun sense, and where our party platform overlaps, I believe that we have to have a two-way conversation and actually go out there and support them in their initiatives in regards to the work that they're doing because they're the thought leaders in their communities. And that's a way to make our party more open and diverse because we're going and investing in others versus just coming around once a year asking them to invest in us and our candidates. Thank you. Thank you. Ed? All right, so short term and long term. Uh, look, I agree with a lot of what Katie said. Short term, we have to really invest in voter education, the amount that's ahead of us, because it's not just for voters who are new voters, but even habitual voters, people who routinely show up, need to know that their polling place is not necessarily going to be their same polling place this time. Grocery stores weren't a thing in the runoff, they might not be a thing in the general election. That's the first hurdle. The other hurdle is getting people invested in vote by mail. Vote by mail is critical. And Texas is one of only nine states that doesn't have 100% access to vote by mail. That's crazy. But for those who do, and for those who are able to exercise that loophole so that they can use it, we both ones they can be safe. And two, it's the ease stress of the places, places with social distancing are going to look like the lines are longer when they actually aren't. And we don't want that to have a suppressive effect this election. So I think that that's critical. Fundraising is also critical. What I'll do the day after elected is I'll sit down with the staff and I'll look at what their budget is and I'll see what the gap is. And whatever we need to raise, I'll sit down and start dialing for dollars and making those meetings to make sure that we make that budget, not just in Q3, but also in Q4, because we have to have a sustained party through the rest of the year. And in Q1, we don't know what this virus is going to carry for us or how long it's going to carry into the new year. Hopefully it'll be gone sooner than later, but we have to hope for the best, plan for the worst. As far as long-term goes, 
we have to keep people engaged. We have to go into the communities. We have to connect with people who live in apartments. We have to develop relationships. Politics is relationship-based. And if we aren't in the community developing those relationships, we can't foster the benefits of it, which is some, a, a better, more progressive life for all of us. Finally, because we're here at the state capitol, a lot of elected officials really appreciate it when we can mobilize people in support of those bills that they're working on. We have the ability to show them that we've got their back. And in the last, elect, uh, the last legislative cycle, there was a big bad voter suppression bill that we were able to beat. There was a regressive sales tax bill that they tried to push. Instead of reforming property tax and Robin Hood, we beat that too. Let me tell you what's gonna come up in this next legislative session. Texas has a massive huh? vaccination has a massive vaccination loophole. We need to make sure that that loophole gets closed so that once there is a coronavirus vaccine, we can do something about it. Thank you, Ed. Jan? All right, so as the big tent party, we have a wide variance of ideals, which often results in substantial infighting. What is your plan for party unification to strengthen our messaging strategy? Starting with you, Ed. So I run an organization called Progress Texas. Many of you may be familiar with it. And Progress occupies a, a unique space on the political spectrum in that we tend to be the bridge between the far left, between the far left and, the, and the middle left. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go so far as to say the moderate uh, left. But, you know, doing that, we really try to exercise unity and find the common ground and the messages that inspire people and empower them to take action. And I think that that starts not only with identifying our common ground, but identifying the things where we don't have common ground and being good listeners. Being a good progressive means being a good listener and admitting that there are some things that maybe you don't know and finding what, what new, learn, new things we can do to build our party together, build our movement together and affect real progressive change in this state. It all starts with unity. We're on the same team. We're fighting for the same things. We might look a little different, but ultimately, if we share the same values, we have the same outcomes. All right, Katie. Um, agreeing with a lot of what Ed said, this is why we're glad to be running alongside each other, but having an important message is definitely a big component of it, but also making sure we have the right messengers it takes time to be working and organizing across the community, showing up at the Austin Justice Coalition event that happened right before this, or grassroots leadership, or Safe P. Um, there are many different organizations across this community, neighborhood associations, precincts, super precincts, uh, and democratic club meetings. It takes time for us to build relationships across the community to make sure that people are open and listening to what we have to say, but also making sure that we've listened to them. Because there are a lot of uh, communities that are hurting right now, whether it's unemployment due to the pandemic, whether it's social justice and violence against people of color, which we see to be systematic, um, not just in Texas, but even in our own community here in Austin. Um, and so making sure that we're listening to what folks uh, are, are uh, hearing and, and feeling, and that we are the party that's standing up to be their support um, and also making sure that we have a place in belonging in this party. At any given time, uh, having talked to many of our precinct chairs, I've heard stories of people feeling like they don't belong because of their age, their ethnicity, the number of tattoos or piercings that they have. And the reality is winning is going to take all of us. And what does it mean to win? It means that we are tackling the issues that matter. There are children in cages in this state at the border. There are literally people who are shot in police presence this week in Austin, Texas. There are women who are being told that they can or cannot make decisions in regards to their body. And there's bullying and harassing on campaigns and workers being, being mistreated. That has to stop now. And we are the party to stop that. The only way we're gonna stop that is by coming together, building that trust, and giving each other the benefit of the doubt that when we have these hard conversations that we can learn from each other and understand what it's like to be in others' shoes. It takes time, it takes rolling up your sleeves, and it takes resources for us to invest in the party we wanna be. Thank you. Thank y'all. Diana. Hey. Um, the next question from our wonderful advisory committee. 
is what do you think are the most two most important skills for the chair to have and what do you what experience do you have having those skills um, and up first will be Katie. Um, so if you ask the precinct chairs, it's running an efficient meeting because I've heard all about Diana's ability to run very efficient meetings. Um, but kind of the, the two reasons why I feel like I am the most qualified candidate and got into um, even considering running for this race was organization and fundraising. Um, you know, when I get told that uh, would you prioritize um, putting money and uh, outreach in East Austin versus West Austin? To me, I reject the premise of that question because I've seen what we can do as a party when we invest in all of Travis County. I'm talking about Maynard, Pflugerville, uh, Lake Travis, Lago Vista, not just Austin, but the entirety of the county. And so for me, having to make a decision between what part of the county we're investing in is a failure on my behalf in that we haven't uh, gotten the resources necessary to make sure that every precinct chair and Democratic club has the resources they need to engage voters. So um, organization, making sure that we're maximizing uh, every dollar that we do raise, as well as ev uh, every club and group that is interested in volunteering and uh, getting voters out to vote for Democrats this fall, that we're organizing them together at the coordinated campaign committee, um, but also doing that organization and outreach year round, right? When it comes to advocacy at the Texas Capitol, we have the legislative session coming up this fall, it's gonna be really important. The other is fundraising. Um, as I said earlier, I spent uh, over a decade raising $8 million for Democrats. I specifically raised $62,000 for the Travis County Democratic Party's coordinated campaign in 2016, helping Vince and working with Vince and some volunteers to make sure that we could afford our phone and mail program. Prior to that, I also raised money as the CBW president to make sure we had staffers like Stella um, that were funded for outreach specifically to female voters. So um, fundraising and organization are the two most important. And uh, thank you. Ed. Unmuted. Okay. <laughs> Once again, I agree with a lot of what Katie says. I'll narrow it down to two things. Look, fundraising is critical. It, a lot of people have big ideas, but if you can't fund it, it's not the same. And that, that's really the party chair's job. You know, there are some very good operatives at the party who know campaigns in and out. And, you know, as, as somebody who's been an operative for 28 years myself, I, I also know campaigns inside and out. But what the party really relies on for the chair is to be able to bring in the dough to, to get the program done so that we can get our candidates elected and have staff that are treated equitably and paid fairly. That all depends on the fundraising. So that is a critical skill set. At Progress Texas, I have to raise close to a million bucks a year. I'm in my eighth year there. I have experience in this area. I'm happy to lend that to the Travis County Democratic Party. Uh, the next thing, look, there, there are many qualities I think that are important, but in general, I think a good chair needs to be a good listener. I think being a good progressive means being a good listener. I mentioned this earlier, but somebody who can be firm but fair and hear people out and still listen to what they have to say, I think are the qualities you need to run a good meeting, the qualities you need to build good relationships. It starts with listening to each other. I think that that's, you know, it doesn't imply a high level of strategy. I realize that, but it does imply a high level of sensitivity. And I think that that is something that is really critical at this juncture right now. And that's what I think I can bring to, uh, to the party. Great. Thank you, Ed. Vince? Thank you, Ed. Uh, so the next question from the precinct chairs is, we have a lot of groups that have formed in addition to the area clubs. What is your plan to get everybody together as a group with the same mission, contributions, lists, lots of sharing, because we all have one goal in mind. Mm -hmm. So this goes to Ed first. So this is something we saw a lot of right after the 2016 election. If you remember, so many new groups popped up, the indivisible groups popped up, uh, I think that some of the, I, I can't remember if it was Swing Left or one of the others, very similar to that, that came about. And the, the thing about it is that this state and even this county is really big. We need all the help we can get. 
And the best way to do it is to bring people together and identify where the common ground is. Now, not everybody has to work on everything, though I do believe in intersectionality, but I think that we do need to be able to kind of look at the playing field and see who has what strengths, whether those strengths are geographic, ethnic, or issue-based. Those are things that we need to be able to identify. And the, here's how we do it. We can't get turfy over it. We have to approach this from a position of abundance. And I realize that sometimes when you're fighting over resources that the, the instinct is to uh, really protect a certain area that we've worked in. But the way that we're gonna get better is by working together. And uh, look, it's not always the easiest thing, but we have to try. And I think working together, that message of unity is how we're able to move the ball in this state. Look, we may be riding high with momentum at the moment, but we still have decades of systematic dismantling of unions, systematic dismantling of the, what tort reform has done to our trial lawyers. There are so many things that Republicans have done to create structural advantage for themselves that it's gonna take a lot of help and a lot of effort to undo some of those things. And I think it starts with working with many of these new groups. Thank you, Ed. Katie? Thanks, Vince. Um, actually, it's been really exciting talking to a lot of the precinct chairs because having been a precinct chair, uh, there are a lot of new faces from when I, when I served. And so I'm really invigorated and excited by that. And I'm also really excited about all the organizations that have come together. And the reason why they're out there organizing is because we, we all care. That's why we're here. Ed and I are definitely not running uh, for a party chair because of our health. Um, it's because we care and we know that this November is the most important election of our lifetimes. And I know we say that over and over again, but the reality is, is that there are life and death situations happening, people unemployed and um, literally lives at stake. And so it's up to us to get it right and it's up to us to come together. So when it comes to the different organizations that are out there doing the organizing and work, we have to support them. We have to come together at the coordinated campaign. If you are working to get voters out this November or spending money in Travis County, I want to talk with you. And I want you to sit down at the table with me, with precinct chairs, with party staff, so that way we can coordinate and maximize every dollar and volunteer called May. So that way when we have somebody doing lit dropping uh, in one precinct, they're not doing it just for one candidate, but they're doing it for all four because we communicate it. Communication is key and process is key and that there's transparency and trust and accountability for the organization spending their time and money and for us to be the people lifting them up and also giving them resources. Our clubs and precinct chairs have spent thousands of their own dollars and time and the party can help by either sending out postcards on their behalf, uh, working with them to help leveraging um, different deals we have in regards to like our bulk mail permit. Um, so when it comes to the functionality, having the party leverage the relationships and contracts that we already have with vendors on behalf of uh, different PACs and, uh, and democratic clubs, I think will really benefit uh, them. The other thing is long-term, we have to do community building internally. Um, a lot of new precinct chairs have felt lost uh, when they first got into the party and didn't know what to do. And so groups like Blue Action Democrats, and I know Sandra Ragona with Netco Dems, has worked really hard to provide that mentorship. Um, Marvin Hecker and Lynn Kurth have been some of the most named precinct chairs because they do the outreach to new precinct chairs and welcome them and also give them the information they need to not feel intimidated. And so... I believe that we need to continue that, but have it county-wide so that everyone feels like they can be welcomed into the party. Thank you, Katie. Jan? All right. So, uh, starting with Katie, if you're elected, what will be your first priority, the first thing you'll do? Raise as much money as possible to make sure we have all the resources necessary this November to kick Donald Trump out of the White House elect Julie Oliver, Mike Siegel, Wendy Davis, and elect Ann Howard to the County Commissioner Precinct 3, and to drive up as many votes as possible for all of our amazing statewide candidates, including uh, our judges who are running uh, for the Texas Supreme Court. Um, so money, money, money. Please donate now. If you are a precinct chair or activist and you are watching this live stream, I will take this two minutes to tell you, you should give money to the party right now. We are a Big Ten party. We're here to support you. Please donate at the link I'm going to ask Brian to put in below. 
All right, thank you, Ed. So I agree with that. Um, we've got to raise the money. And the first thing I'll do is sit down with the staff after elected and find out what the fundraising gap is between the day that we start and the day we get elected. We're not, we're not gonna have a lot of time. And we've got to be able to raise that money for our program. So looking at what those gaps are and then trying to find out how we can bring that in. Here's the thing about that fundraising is that we have to make sure that our revenue is diversified. We have to look at this as a mutual fund where we've got different elements inside that make it strong. And so that means online fundraising, one-on-one -on -one calls. Obviously, we just had a very big event. And then you've got your larger donors that can give as well. So I think that having that diverse uh, fundraising ability is not only going to make it healthy for the party, but it's gonna help us be more sustainable down the road. Uh, beyond that, what we need to do is start working on our diversity right away. We need to make sure that we're recruiting people who are members of the party and that, uh, that can become precinct chairs that aren't just with us for the 90 days until the election day, but that stick with us beyond that. I think that's critical. Uh, diversity is very important to me. I mentioned earlier that my family immigrated here from Peru. My brothers and I were the first ones born here. We had experiences in this country that many people are experiencing right now. And to be able to share those experiences and connect with people and bring them into our party, I think is especially important right now at a time where our country is really struggling with the question of race and diversity. I think that we can lead with our values by leading in that area. Those will be two of the first things that I'll do. We've got to raise the money. We've got to look like the people we're fighting for. And then of course, we got to run up the score. We can do a lot of damage here in Travis County, damage in a good way. And I think we can do it by running up the score on election day. All right, thanks. Diana. All right. Um, this one, just get ready, it's a tough one. <laughs> in our most recent election, there was um, a lot of dialogue around the race for the position of the 353rd court where Madeline Connor was elected. Keep in mind, the party has rules about not getting involved to support one Democratic nominee over another in the party. And there are severe sanctions for both the party chair and precinct chairs if they do involve themselves or do denounce the Democratic nominee. Moving forward, how would you address this situation if, if it arose again? Up first is Ed, is that right? Yes, Ed. Um, I'll tell you what I'd want to do is I'd want to find out if we can suspend the rules to make an endorsement. Because this has happened with Republicans. Robert Morrow, the, the jackass with the jester hat who runs for everything in their party and sometimes gets their nomination, gets involved and they take a position to keep him from going anywhere. Look, she is our Robert Morrow right now, this, this, this incoming justice. And this is not, I mean, this is not just bad politics, this is bad policy. So if there's a situation like this where it gets away from us and look, I'm all for not getting involved in primaries under normal circumstances. That was not a normal circumstance. And if we're able to let that slide, I don't wanna to signal to Matt Makoviak or anybody else that they can game the system by putting unknowns into unknown offices and perhaps getting them elected. I realize that might be unpopular with some folks. To be honest with you, I don't even know if the rules will allow it. But if there is an element of Robert's rules with our rules that will allow us to suspend and take up that motion, I would suggest that we consider it in those extreme circumstances, but it is not something that we should make a habit out of. Should I just start? <laughs> yes, sorry, send it off mute, go ahead. Um, so, you know, having, having worked on Democratic campaigns here locally, um, after selling my shop uh, in 2017, uh, I'm uniquely uh, hypersensitive to weighing in on a Democratic primary because I really believe that the party has to be a neutral space when it comes to supporting anyone seeking office in the nomination. 
um, and that there can't be any conflicts of interest uh, present. Um, that's why I believe in an open and transparent process where we have a coordinated campaign committee as well as a finance committee that are reporting um, and the advisory committee, which I, I um, am very thankful for, to, to have that level of transparency when the chair is making these decisions. Um, having talked to party lawyers and to, to party staff, um, there is precedent uh, for the party weighing in in a Democratic primary um, as an individual as the chair or as individual precinct chairs. While I am hypersensitive to that because I've, I've worked in Democratic primaries before many years ago, but you know, um, still, you don't want anyone to believe that the party's taking one person's side over another unless it's for the integrity of the party. And I believe in this instance, there is a very sound case as to why the integrity of the party and the candidates that we put up for nominee in the general election, it's important for the party to have weighed in on that. Um, the process that I would put in place, um, since there is a precedent for us to be able to do so, is to make sure that there is a open discussion of the precinct chairs and a vote by the precinct chairs. It would have to be at least two thirds in order for me to feel comfortable to inform uh, voters or to inform the, the media in regards to the different uh, background aspects of each candidate. I still don't think the party should make an endorsement of candidates, um, but I do think that, the, that voters have a right to information and that people do look to the party uh, to get that information. And while it's a very gray and uncomfortable area to protect um, the integrity of, the, the, um, of your candidates in November, I believe it's important for us in extreme circumstances like this to take action. All right, so here's my first question to you two. Um, Democrats have controlled Austin for generations. Even with that, the life expectancy in 78724, which is primarily African American and Hispanic, is 15 years less than 78704. One third of our minority children are growing up in poverty. So my question is, what are some things that you've done in the past to address racial disparities? And what would you do as party chair to help make things better? So um, we are not a diverse, city as diverse as we could be when it comes to our policies when it comes to the people who represent us it's gotten better we have one of the most diverse tickets of people running this fall um, in regards to gender and ethnicity and identity but we can do better um, i work in healthcare. Um, i joined my family's company in 2017 after my father got ill and i work with medicare and medicaid recipients on a daily basis. And I've seen what access to quality healthcare can do. Um, I can also tell you that the system is not set up to support that people of color, people who have um, economic challenges, uh, people who have uh, housing instability or mental health problems, um, they do not get access to healthcare and they do not get support. And it's because the system was not built for them to receive that support. And so on a daily basis, I am constantly fighting with the state of Texas to make sure that every person eligible does receive the quality health care that they deserve. Um, in my own personal life, uh, I volunteered with a number of different organizations over the years, uh, including FIT, which is Food and Tummies that delivers backpacks and meals on the weekends, um, particularly in, to two middle schools in Del Valley. And I've also made sure that we are supporting some of the most de uh, diverse candidates who are seeking transformational change in our community um, and, uh, and believe that we have to continue to recruit diverse activists, not just in terms of volunteers, but precinct chairs and candidates. Um, I'm very proud to have been supported by and to have supported um, some of our first, uh, well not first, but our first lesbian Latina uh, state representative, Sally Israel and Cheryl Cole, um, Bridget Shea, Velda Price and others, um, George Morales, who does great community organizing because I believe that we have to invest in the communities, but also the people doing that organizing year round. And so I've done that in my professional life and in my personal life um, because I believe we have to walk the walk and talk the talk. Thank you, Katie. Ed? Uh, you're on you're mute, Ed. Ed. There we go. There you go. Can you hear me now? 
Uh, again, uh, a personal issue for me as well. Um, you know, I, I um, uh, am at a place in life right now where things are pretty good, but wasn't always that way. You know, I mean, we were the family that when there were canned food drives in the hol over the holidays, we were the family that actually got the tray of the canned food. And I think that being able to walk in the shoes of the people that you're fighting for is a real big issue here because there's not, you can't always understand what they're going through unless you've gone through it. This isn't to say that you, you'll never understand it, but there is a certain authenticity, a relationship with that. And I think that the fact that this city, by the way, Vince, I didn't know it was a 15 year disparity between two sides. I thought it was a 10 year, but even 10 years, even if it's still that, not good enough. That's like, that's, that's crazy. The fighting for things like a $15 minimum wage, health care for everybody, making sure that there is a Planned Parenthood clinic so people can get their flu shots, well woman exams, and anything else they need right away are critical services for people. I don't know why we fight, well, I do know why we fight over this so much at the state level, because Republicans are crazy, but the fact is, is that we have the ability to stand up for what we believe in, and can we please get out of the central core so much in this county and pay attention to places like Dell Valley, which, okay, you're getting Tesla. What is the school going to get now? What are the school lunches going to look like now? We need to do more for areas that are just overlooked. And I think that it starts with people taking a global view, a holistic view to our county and recognizing that Travis County isn't just Austin, even though I live here in Austin but at places like Maynor and Pflugerville and Lakeway as well. The only way we're gonna connect with these communities is to understand what they're going through, to engage with groups like the Austin Justice Coalition, which thank God they're getting so much attention right now. It's a worthy group and I'm, I'm so pleased to see them in the news every day. Uh, they're doing great work. But also for those who are less fortunate, the homelessness in the city is a big issue that requires our attention. Going back and really understanding what people are going through, I think is important. And that's how we can start to bridge that gap. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, Katie. Jan? So um, when I was chair, I was a real stickler for neutrality in the Democratic primary. And uh, to the point where some of my staff thought I went overboard, I told them they didn't, I didn't even think they should like a candidate on Facebook um, because I wanted to make it clear of it that we were neutral. And I'm, I'm wondering what will your policy on neutrality be and how will you combine the need to go out and recruit diverse candidates with the need to maintain neutrality in races other than ones like Madeline Connors? So, Ed. I think oh, Ed's, okay. Uh, Wait. Uh, I'm sorry, I thought Katie was first. Um, neutrality while bringing Thanks. people in. Um, look, neutrality is important. If you're working for the party, you are a staff member at the party. And of course, you're gonna have your personal opinions. Everybody does, but also realize that the job you have is a job where you're performing service to a community that is beyond just what candidates you believe in. And the trade-off to that is that we're fighting for people who are our nominees in the general election. Look, let's perfect example, like I will, as has been said, I will crawl over broken glass for Joe Biden, but he was not my first choice, but he is our nominee and he is our path to getting things better in this country. And the same thing happens at the Travis County level. Now for nonpartisan races heading towards a general election, we, we've got to do our best to, staff really needs to keep their distance from showing their preferences on that too. Now, Jan, you said you didn't want to, them to, to like the candidates on Facebook. I would actually go the opposite direction. I would say like all of the candidates so that you're getting all of their materials and find out what's happening in all the races. It'll make you a better staffer, if anything else, if nothing else. Um, your second question was about recruiting people from the community. And you know, I, th I think that a lot of issues in the community, they transcend candidacies. They have to do with the issues we talked about a minute ago, about engaging high school students. Uh, they talk about uh, folks who really want to recognize the problem. Look, this is a great county that we live in. We got problems in this county. 
And we have to be able to actively talk about them and address them in meaningful ways where we can get to know each other and develop relationships. And that, again, gonna transcend candidates. And then we have some great candidates in this county, but we, we, it's, it's more than that because this election in particular is bigger than a candidate. It's bigger than me, it's bigger than you. It's so, and, and I think that many of the issues we deal with at the county level are the same way. Thank you, Katie. Um, I, I can agree with you more in terms of neutrality, barring obviously the extreme situation of Madeline Connor. Um, you know, frankly, having been involved in the party for such a long time, um, I thought I'd think about what I want the party to be. Um, I hadn't really ever envisioned myself as running for party chair, but I wouldn't have, you know, four or five years ago because I was working as a consultant, and so I was not neutral. And um, the only reason why I feel that I am fit to do this now is because I haven't been uh, involved in campaigns and feel like you have to have a neutral place for people to come to get access to information, to get access to resources um, in regards to understanding how van works. And so um, I believe that the party has to be that place for all um, in regards to especially candidates. Um, and there's a way that you can be pretty open and transparent, especially when it comes to recruiting candidates as well. Um, but you know that trust has to be earned uh, with folks and it's done by actions. And it can't just stop at party chair and party staff, but also the vendors that the party uses. Um, we can't be using folks who work for the party who then trash Democratic candidates on social media because that is then is an extension of the party. And so I would work to make sure that uh, we have an open process to select vendors, that the precinct chairs are a part of that committee that selects the vendors and here's the presentations to make sure that any vendor that we work with, it's due because the best price point and the best product for them. Same thing when it comes to making any decisions and how the resources are used. So that way during a primary or during a general election, one candidate doesn't feel like they're getting preferential treatment over another. And when it comes to making really important decisions, um, you know, there've been some really hard decisions that, that all three of you have had to make as chair. I would go to the party, uh, the state party for their advice. And I'd also go to the lawyers to ask them, what is the responsibility of the chair? What is it that we can do? What is in the best interest of the party? And every decision that I make and every um, challenge that I would tackle is what is in the best interest of the party. And being united is what's in the best interest of the party and having that neutral place for people to feel unity is of paramount importance, both in primaries and in generals. And when it comes to recruiting candidates, I think we have to be really open about trainings and opportunities for people to learn about the different roles of government, uh, whether it's uh, county commissioners or judges or state reps, and to give people the resources and training needed to, to consider running for office. All right, Diana, I think you're up. Great, thanks y'all. This is kind of a long question, so I'm happy to repeat it if you need. Um, as chair, our community stakeholders will call on you to help ensure that our party is not only unified, but that all people feel welcome, respected, dignified, and safe when they're volunteering with the party. In my own experience, many volunteers have disclosed to me repeated instances of other Democratic volunteers making offensive remarks exhibiting racist behavior, either overtly or indirectly, and even bad actors who have repeatedly been accused of sexual harassment. Most of this behavior is not illegal, but it still makes the party unsafe and unwelcoming. As party chair, if you received information from multiple sources or even a single source about a bad actor within the volunteer ranks of the party, how would you address it? Katie, I believe you're first. So, as someone who started in the party at a very young age, volunteering as a young female, um, I can tell you that I've been made to feel very uncomfortable in regards to my professional ability, um, my body, how I look, uh, and whether or not I'm cute or attractive, and um, been felt pressured and bullied by people, quite frankly. Uh, I've received verbal abuse at the hand of a number of my uh, colleagues when I was working in campaigns. And so um, I can tell you that it absolutely will not and cannot be tolerated. 
Um, I recently worked with um, Ryan Rothschild, uh, Chrissy O'Brien, and some precinct chairs uh, to put in place a resolution that I support um, and that the party would engage in a labor peace agreement. That is uh, setting as you know, a line in the sand in regards to how we want workers to be treated. But I believe that the same extension of respect and dignity must be extended to our volunteers and our precinct chairs. You know, like I said, a lot of the precinct chairs I've talked to have said that they don't feel like a place of belonging because of their age, the color of their skin, um, their identity, and uh, where they come from. And so there's a lot of soul searching we have to do as a party to have those hard conversations so that when somebody does make an offensive remark, regardless if they realized it or not, that that gets, so that becomes a teachable moment if, if the um, offense warrants it. And then if it's a continued pattern of behavior that is exclusionary, then we have to address that as a party as to our values and whether or not we want people in the party who are going to be welcoming or exclusionary. And you know, recently, especially when it comes to our candidates, I've seen terrible things posted about people who are just offering up their time and talent to make the world a little bit better place in their community. And the way they've been treated is just appalling. And so we have to make sure that um, we, we, we stop that cycle of, of negative treatment of people and that people have a safe place to report uh, any type of abuse or um, uh, uh, incident, um, that they then have a due process internally that the party supports where that's investigated and that they then have, um, you know, their, their say and that, uh, we make sure that we take a stand as a party that we will not tolerate bullying, verbal abuse, sexual harassment, um, and that we support anyone who, uh, has been on the receiving end of that. Um, it has to stop now. And Diana, you've done a lot of great work in regards to that. I know making a, a place where people can confidentially come to you and I would continue that and welcome uh, that. But I also make a, an open process where the party um, takes action. Thank you, Ed. Yeah, look, we have to have zero tolerance on any kind of harass workplace harassment. And that starts with from the top, right? If you don't set that tone early on, then people are gonna push it, but harassers aren't gonna go where they're not welcome. And, you know, harassment comes in so many different forms. It comes in uh, sexual harassment, workplace harassment, people berating employees and treating them poorly. It also comes in people being subjugated because of how they look or what their race is or what their income or economic status is. Those things can't be tolerated. Now, if somebody infringes upon them and, and, and they will, like there will be infractions. We have to find out if those infractions are teachable moments and if they are, then we work with those people to make them better. But I do think that precinct chairs should either go through undoing racism or through courageous conversations. I've been through both. I found them incredibly helpful. As somebody myself who is Latino, but I also have privilege, I'm light skinned, I have light eyes. I'm the only one of my brothers that have light skin and light eyes. It's not a mistake that I'm also the only one that went to college. But that we have to recognize that those things are privileges that help people. It also means that we gotta recognize there's a difference between diversity and anti-racism. And there are elements of racism in our society that many people don't even recognize as racism. That's a problem and we have to be able to reverse it. Um, you know, I really operate in two different worlds. And the, the thing is, is that I can go into rooms looking much like I do now with a blazer and a collar shirt. And for the most part, I'll be fine, but I've been pulled over nine times in four years. You know, once for driving too fast, once for driving too slow, once because I made a left turn that was a little too fast. Um, you know, experiencing that, I know I'm gonna be fine when a cop comes to my window. But the fact that driving a certain car in a certain part of town is gonna have you treated differently than somebody that looks a little differently and drives something else was really striking to me because again, I operate in these two different worlds and I've had to experience that here in Texas, 
I didn't know until after I lived here for four years that stepping out of the car was not a normal thing. Those are experiences that we have to recognize that people go through every day and do our best to either accommodate for them and make sure they don't happen to them, that they feel safe at work, that they feel safe in our party, and that this is a city that is welcoming and a county that is welcoming to them. Thank you. Uh, so my next question is a little bit of a history, and I'll get to the question, but so in 1871, the Austin American Statesman was created to fight Reconstruction, to support the Confederacy, to support slavery. Fast forward 57 years, the 1928 plan in Austin, which segregated by law African Americans in East Austin, Latinos in East Austin whites, and West Austin. Uh, we are coming up on the 100 year anniversary of that. Um, as we have seen, we have the same folks, African Americans and Latinos that were forced into East Austin, now being pushed out because of gentrification. And so my question to you is, what are you gonna do about it as party chair uh, in the short term, but also as we think about coming up on the 100 year anniversary of this 1928 plan, where, like, where do you want the party to be at when this comes? I think, Ed, I think you're first. Okay. So put the land development question on me right from the get-go. Huh? <laughs> All right. Look, let's, re let's recognize something important. The Travis County Democratic Party is not and will not be a legislative body. That is not our role. So in terms of actually changing code or anything like that, it's not our purview that's up to our elected leaders to sort that out. So that, let, me, let me start with that as a premise. Here's what the party can do. Now, I've been through Leadership Austin, and in that class, we learn a lot about the demographics of the city and the 1928 plan and how it was developed. And look, there are great inequities here. We talked again about the difference between the, whether it's 10 or 15 years in lifespan from the east to the west, but the, the city has grown to the point to where people are getting pushed out. Austin Metro is one of the few places, urban areas, that's getting less diverse because of the expense. We as a party may not be the ones to find that answer, but what we can do is bring the community together, whether it's leaders who live downtown or those who live on the east side and on the west side. We have to have those conversations. We can't be afraid of having those conversations so that we can have a better understanding of what needs to be done in order to make this more affordable. But let's go back to some other things that, that push people out because it's not just housing, but it's also things like good jobs. Do you have a good job that will pay you a good wage to afford to live here? Are we taking care of our service workers? Are we taking care of our musicians that make this the live music capital in the world? But during the campaign, uh, during my fiance's campaign, we had a storage unit down in South Austin where we kept yard signs. The guy who worked at that storage unit lived in another county because he didn't make enough money to live in this county. Those are problems that affect this, this county and we can foster conversation. We can bring awareness to those. But again, recognizing that we're not a legislative body and we need to let, we need to give our, our elected leaders space to, to develop their, to, to run with their expertise on that. Thank you, Ed. Katie? I'm really glad Ed got to go first on that question because it's a really <laughs> hard topic and it's an important one. And it's a serious one because it says something about our community and the fabric of our community that it's changing so much and, and in many ways not for the better um, that people are being pushed out that, you know, when I was talking earlier about that donut and the donut hole um, that people can't afford to live in a city where um, there is a lot that's great about Austin, but when it comes to, uh, economic equity, uh, racial equity, housing equity, um, it's just non-existent. So as a party, um, there are planks in our platform that we can rely on to do organizing on these issues, to take stances, um, whether it's at you know, uh, City of Austin or Travis County or Cedar Park City Council, Pflugerville, where the party can do year-round organizing on these issues and engaging with um, you know, neighborhood and community organizations who in many cases are led by people of color where we are supporting uh, their work and the brain trust that they provide to this community. Um, you know, it's, not, it's, not, uh, it's not an accident that Highway 35, I-35 
and Mopac were built where they were. Um, they were built to, to um, frankly, keep people out and to keep others in. Um, and it's not just in terms of geography, but the economics, uh, access to infrastructure. You know, during this pandemic, we've now seen that where you live is one of the biggest predeterminants to your health, uh, to your ability to work from home and work remotely and still have a job right now. Um, as many of our friends um, and, and particularly our artist community is hurting so much um, because they don't have a way to make ends meet. And so the party can and should take stances um, when and where available in regards to um, it being laid out in our platform, but also resolutions. And we also have to realize that the work of the Travis County Democratic Party doesn't stop at the city limits of Austin. Um, we need to go outside of the city limits of Austin because that's where you see true diversity uh, in Pflugerville and, and um, Cedar Park and Round Rock and Manor. Um, that's where a lot of our precinct chairs are living and organizing because they can't afford to live in Center City. Um, and the other thing too, is we have a real opportunity to work with Williamson and Hayes County. It's kind of a metroplex because um, where we do see gentrification pushing people out, they're still trying to stay close you know, to, to the urban center. And so working with them to make sure that when it comes to affordable housing, um, transportation, that we're supporting the different uh, ballot initiatives, et cetera, to invest in communities having access to this important infrastructure. Thank you, Katie. Jan? So it's hard to, to uh, settle on one question. I think there's a lot of good questions that can be asked. Um, I'm thinking back to when I was chair and one of the things we did to raise a lot of money was we had these big JBR dinners at fancy hotels and um, and they were really successful in raising a lot of money, but they also um, gave rise to concerns, which, which I shared, um, that we were blocking out some of our precinct chairs and other people who couldn't afford uh, full freight on those kinds of events. So what do you do in order to make sure that while you're raising money at, at successful fundraisers, you're not blocking out the people who actually are the worker bees and the people who really care about the party, but just can't afford um, that kind of sponsorship. So we have to have a diverse group of people when it comes to folks investing in the party. And that means diversity in the amount that they can give to, whether it's $5 or $10 online, um, you know, getting $25 from a single mom with two kids who's currently unemployed means so much more than getting a thousand dollar check from a multimillionaire who is currently able to, to still keep their job. And so we have to recognize that each person's contribution, regardless of the actual size of it, is of value to this party. Um, and we have to structure events, both uh, online and eventually when this pandemic's over, hopefully in person, that we structure those events um, uh, accordingly. The other issue here too is, a lot of times people feel like uh, when they're giving money to the party that they're gaining access in some way, whether it's to decisions made by the party or elected officials that the party supports. And I think the important thing we have to do as a party is to provide access to us as a party, but also our elected officials year round. So that way when we're having panel discussions about the Tesla plant or whether or not um, you know, we should have rail in the next transportation bond, that we have year-round open uh, programming for activists, volunteers, um, and people just generally interested in these issues to ask questions and to make um, the elected officials who represent our values accessible and we, we provide that format um, for people to engage with them and that we also make our party operations accessible. And I think, you know, I've heard very good stories about when Diana was moving the different meetings around the county so that people could participate, um, continue to hold diverse, uh, geographically diverse, but also um, media diverse in that, you know, online forums, in-person events, um, make those available to folks, not just who have given money, but have also given time and talent. Um, our precinct chairs and our volunteers are some of our most underutilized and underthanked groups and that we have to make sure that they understand that they're the backbone of the party. That's what I grew up doing. 
was volunteering on campaigns, um, you know, stamping envelopes, making calls. And that was a real value to the party and that that can't be replaced by a check. So I believe the question was, how do we diversify our funding? How do we ensure that we are funding is, that we have opportunities for everybody to get involved? Um, look, I'm 47. I've seen a lot of, lots of different fundraisers over the years, big fundraisers, small donor fundraisers. But ultimately, the reason people give to a party is because they believe in what you're doing. They believe in your mission and they don't think your money's being wasted. They like the people who are running it. They think they believe that those people share their values. That belief more than anything else is why people give. Uh, I remember three or four years ago when my friend Mike Lewis was running for chair, he called me up to tell me why he was gonna run. And one of the things he talked about was having these paper plate fundraisers. We didn't have to have a gala all the time, but we could have these $25 paper plate fundraisers the way that Bernie Sanders had done it when he was running in Vermont. Now, I'm not a Bernie guy. I wasn't familiar with that, but I thought it was real. I loved it. I loved the idea of it. Bring people together and bring down the barriers. And if people want to give more, they can. Now, obviously, $25 paper plate is not going to fuel the TCDP. But having events like that that bring people in. Katie, you mentioned the word programming. I think that that's key. We should think about things like programming rather than events, because when you have a program, I think that people appreciate the value of what you're offering, whether it's a panel where we're talking about an issue like vote by mail or vaccines or Black Lives Matter or anything that's gonna be right in front of us in the next few months or the next year. Those are good things that people will pay to come to. Now, the big donors that will show up for the big events, look, the big events are nice and eventually, one day, we'll get back to them. And I, would, I can't wait until we can have this, a forum like this in person. But until then, we've got to find a way to bring people into the party and convince them to give, whether that's $25 or 2,500 or 25,000 if you've got it. But it's gonna start with a belief that this is the place for them to do it. And that takes a leader that can convince them that it is. Great, thank you so much um, for those wonderful questions, Judge Schoifer and Vincent. We really appreciate that. Um, that was all of our questions today, and I know we got many, many more in the chat, and I really appreciate them. Um, if Ed and Katie are amenable, I think we'd like to um, have some precinct chairs maybe coalesce those questions together and ask for maybe 10 or so and ask for brief written responses from you all that we can post um, on the party website and on our social media platforms this week as well as many of our precinct chairs are making their final um, decisions on this very important vote. As we close out um, our precinct chair, our forum today for county party chair, I want to remind people that precinct chairs who were elected on the, no on the March ballot are the only voters eligible to participate in this election. Um, so if you like to weigh in on this race, please contact your nearest precinct chair, either your precinct chair, and many precincts are vacant. Um, and so when we talk about issues around undoing um, systemic bias and racism and institutional bias, um, it looks like things like this, right? This is not my favorite process in the world in terms of letting democracy speak, but is the process that has been legislated for us. So we're going to follow it and make it as fair and transparent as possible and try to support a robust dialogue so people have lots of information to make that important decision. So um, Ed and Katie, y'all will each have two minutes closing remarks. And then, like I said, if y'all are amenable, we will follow up with some written questions and give y'all additional time to respond to those. And we will put those out um, in some accessible formats for people to see your additional responses to those uh, very thoughtful questions that we got in the chat. I also want to thank Judge Schoifer as well for joining us today as one of our co-moderators and Vincent Harding for joining us as a co-moderator as well. Jan and Vince, thank y'all so much for your incredible leadership and partnership. They have been my unofficial advisory committee around along with several of our um, other former party chairs, including former Senator Watson um, and Chris Elliott, who is very involved with me as well. So I'm looking forward um, to continuing to working with them and supporting whoever our new party chair is. Thank you to Camille Teeler, our timekeeper and wonderful staff member from the party, and to Brian Stoller, as always, um, on our tech. And I know Cindy was tuning in and watching online and helping monitoring comments too, along with many of our other staff. 
We are going to be closing up now and we will have two minute closing remarks. First, Ked, Katie, and then from Ed. <laughs> so first I just wanna thank all of you and, and particularly the folks listening to this. Um, I hope to earn your vote. Um, and more importantly, I hope that we can work together to change the relationship between our party and our community. I believe that uh, Diana has done a lot of work in regards to that, to make it a more open and diverse um, listening party that's engaging and folks outside of just the party infrastructure. But the reality is, is that we're in a unique moment in history and it's a hard time for us to really reconcile with where the party can and should be when it comes to being on the right side of history. And I think that the only way we're gonna get there is together. The reason I'm running is not just because I've been involved in democratic politics my whole life as a volunteer, as an activist, um, intern, then consultant, but because I really believe and care in what the party stands for. And I think if we focus on that as a party and come together around the issues that unite us, we can and will win this November. But on August 4th, regardless of who wins, I offer my time and talent to the party as I have in many years past. You know, if I win, I've already let Ed know I'm gonna ask him to be my vice chair. And if I lose, I offer to be his vice chair because I believe that for two people to lose all sanity and run for this spot, um, you know, really deserves each other. Um, I can promise you that to me, a legacy well left to the party, if I were to be chair, is one that has as many precinct chairs placed uh, as possible that are reflective of the communities they serve. Um, that has an active uh, interest in people being party chair. I think the fact that two people want to replace Diana um, is a good thing, that we have to have competition of ideas and discussion, and that more voices participating uh, is important. I also can promise you that when it comes to infrastructure for the precinct chairs and for our clubs, that those are the key organizing uh, focuses I'm going to have to make sure that no precinct goes left behind when it comes to organizing and no voter is taken for granted and is educated on their right to participate not just in an election in november but year round inside austin and outside of austin um, i'm very thankful for the opportunity to share my ideas and vision of the party with you and i would hope to continue this conversation um, please feel free to give me a call or email um, as well as to reach out to me at katieforchair.com thank you so much Thank you, Katie. Ed, closing remarks. Well, everybody, thanks for joining us tonight. And uh, it's been a great conversation. Thanks, Katie, all of our past chairs and our timekeeper and everybody who tuned in. Uh, I've been working in politics since 1992. That's 28 years. That's more years than I care to admit sometimes. Uh, and I don't come from a political family. Look, my dad is a union man. Plumbers and Pipe Fitters Local 250. And it was the union that helped put me through college. It was the union that, even though I was never a member, helped shape who I am today. And it's why today I was endorsed by the Laborers International Union. It's why I agree with the Labor Peace Agreement and why I think that unions are an important part of who we are in this organization, in this party, in this state. In addition to that, I think that our values are ones that we have to express as Democrats because simply being a Democrat and part of the party is important, but we got to stand for something. And I believe that a stand for something, standing for something means having a progressive voice, mobilizing Democrats to run up the score, diversifying our uh, racism, and making sure that we're communicating those messages to people so that they can repeat them with confidence. There's so many people out there that we have here on TV. They need those messages. And I've heard you, precinct chairs. I've talked to so many of you. I've called and emailed all of you, and I've talked to most of you. I know Katie has too. The thing is, is that I hear what you're asking for materials, and I think that you deserve materials. But you're also, I know you could also use talking points. And that's a big part of what I do in the media. I go on Fox most days into the lion's den and I, I tussle it up with, with uh, Matt Makoviak. And most days I get the best of them. And that's because we've got strong talking points that give people confidence that we can share on TV so other people can listen and believe in it. Finally, my last point, if we're gonna do any of this, 
we have to do it united together. Forget about the divisive primaries or any kind of things you got mixed up in. All of that ugliness is behind us now because there's a much bigger threat on election day and we'll only get there if we're united. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. My name is Ed Espinosa. You can learn more about me at edespinosa.com. That's Espinosa with a Z. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ed and Katie. Thank you again to our wonderful co-moderators, Vince and Judge Jan Soifer. I very much appreciate y'all being here today. Any closing remarks for our candidates before we head out? Good luck and get some sleep right now. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, thank you all both for being willing to do this um, unpaid, uh, very intense uh, time commitment kind of job. And um, I think the precinct chairs are lucky to have both of y'all running. Thank you. Thank y'all so much. And like I said, um, our past chairs were some of my best allies and advisors coming into this role. I have already pledged my support to y'all to continue to serve as immediate past chair. Um, in any way I can help whoever our next chair is to help navigate um, this very rewarding job as party chair. Thank you so much to our wonderful advisory committee as well. Again, Bob Sheldon, Sandra Ragona, Lynn Kurth, Carrie Jones, Teresa Pham, and Roy Woody for helping to make sure that this uh, forum happened and to help put our questions together for our audience from our precinct chairs. Our team will be following up with both Ked and AD, Katie. <laughs> Keep getting those all together, Katie and Ed to get um, some written responses to a couple of other great questions that we had come in through the chat. So we'll give y'all a couple of um, some time to respond this week so we can put that up in writing as well. Thank y'all again so much to our audience for joining us. We appreciate our precinct chairs, all of our volunteers and stakeholders so much. Y'all have a wonderful night and thank you for joining us for this important forum. Bye everyone. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye.